A strange. Is it a combined parsha this week? I, I, don't think so. I don't think so. Do not. Okay. Usually, when we leave here, we have to well, you get more light. So, so Tazria. Oh my goodness, that's terrible. I remember the Ramban. Terrible one. Which might be very interesting. Why does a woman who gives birth to a baby have to bring a korban after a period of time? Why does she have to bring a korban? One of which is a sin offering, a chatat which is a strange thing to do when you bring a baby. When you bring a baby into the world, right, you would think you would be very grateful. You'd bring a thank you, Korban, but what's this? Okay. And then the last one, last topic, a hanes ve'apela pele benigei haguf beged v'bayit. The miracles and the wonders that are connected to the so-called leprosy, tzarat, Mm-hmm. that are afflicting the skin of the body, clothing, and houses. Which doesn't make sense, right? I mean, in other words, what kind of a, what kind of a disease I mean, mold. occurs to body? Mold. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mold. So, you know, sometimes mold is you probably pretty related. universal. Why, anybody who has a mold on his baguette should have to burn it? Uh, well, maybe like, I guess if you don't that, want it to spread, right? Have you seen that mold? Like know. contaminated. And um, and if it's in the house and persists, then you break down the house and then maybe you won't have a mold. So it's a little bit, you know, what what is it? What He says it's a miracle. It's a, it's a kind of a spiritual message of some kind, mm-hmm. which he discusses. So you either take the woman who gives birth or the... Negaim, that is the, the afflictions of Tzara'at in skin, clothing, and houses. I like first one is good. And the next one, if we have time, we'll we could, We might like, end up doing both. We'll see. Yeah. But that's all I've got on Tazria, at least as exceptional things that I mentioned. So the first one is Perik Yud Beit, 12, 7 yeah. in Vayikra. That's what well, so how did you know that? I don't know. Maybe you just uh, guessed. Such my prophecy. Idea. Yes. Sir. I'm not surprised. Yeah. And she shall offer it before the eternal and make a for her. Twelve. And she shall be seven. Okay, so we're talking about if a woman gives birth to a male then such and such. If she gives birth to a female, then such and such, and so on and so on and so on. And then, and then, at the end of a period of time when she is clean for a son or a daughter, she will bring keves ben shnatole ola, a one-year-old, or less than one-year-old uh, sheep, right, for a ola, which is burnt as an offering of trying to raise yourself up or whatever, right? And it's burnt entirely on the altar, completely. The only thing that is kept is the skin which belongs to the Ghanim. It's sort of thank you. Sort of thank you. Yes, as a, I guess it's a thank you and a spiritual rising up. As is after yeah. 40 days of the... Yeah, yeah. When, however, we're not going to discuss the period before that. There's a certain period of waiting until she brings this korban. Fine. But then when she brings the korban, that's what we're focusing on. What kind of korban she brings? She brings an ola, which is a completely burnt, rising up offering. And then the son of a pigeon or a tor some kind of a dove, right? A, a ben yona, does that mean that it's male? Bar yona. Huh? I think the word doesn't, doesn't specify sexuality of birds. Doesn't. So I guess it's it's a a member of that family, I suppose, of a yona or a tor, a pigeon or a, or a dove, lechatat, as a son, sin offering. El petach mm-hmm. to the opening of the tabernacle, to the Kohen. And he gives it, he brings it, right? And he atones for her. And she is cleansed. And so on. This is what the Torah says, led at. this is the these regulations. Okay? And if she can't afford a 
sheep, then she takes two doves yes. or two pigeons, whatever they are, right? Echad le'olav, echad le'chatat. Then she doesn't bring the sheep, she brings a bird for the ola and a bird for the chatat, mm -hmm. and so on. Okay, so what's going on? The surprising thing is the chatat, right? And if what she, is she does some chatat, there are two doves. If what? If she can't afford the two doves? Then she has to ask for someone to give her, I suppose, I don't know. It's the only alternative that is given. They were, no, uh, they were apparently uh, pretty cheap. There's no grain in this one. I know what you mean. There's one other offering about korban ole, korban olevi olevi oreid, where a person can bring at the end of the day yeah. a um, ashamtalui. You know, mm -hmm. ashamtalui therefore gives either an animal or a bird or a grain offering. Mm -hmm. So here it isn't an option apparently. But the question really is, what is it all about? Why bring a sin offering after you bring a child into the world. My mother, when she gave birth to me, probably had to bring the sin offering. That's true, but that's a special mm -hmm. case. Yeah. Right? Uh, because, because she gave birth to me. Right. Nice. This into the world. Me, yeah. me, yeah. especially. Yeah. So. There's not people who can't, who can't, who can't have children at all. Right. Um, yes, it's true. Uh, I am not going to talk about it. You are right. I understand yeah, all those things. Oh, so, so, yeah, you debate you. Zion. So the Ramban in the discussion here is going to be on page, for us, on page... Do you have it? On page uh, Samach Bal. I was off the page. <laughs> okay. You have it? Sure. Yes, I have it. Okay, so... Yomar, it shall say, we, we, we mean to say, Shetakriv kofer nafsha lifnei Hashem. Um, hmm. Okay, maybe we should bring back another Ramban. I, I, I will, we'll see in a moment. She shall bring a, some kind of an atonement of her life, for her life. Kofer nafsha. Now, kofer is a big word for the Ramban. You should, it could be a ransom. Kofir. Kofir. Not, you see, we mean, we think usually when we say kapara, Yom Kippur, it's a day of atonement, meaning you feel bad about something and you're getting forgiveness for something. That's what we usually mean by that word, Kippur. That's not related to the Kofir, the Jews in the Ark. It's Noah's time, remember? No, I see what you mean, yes. <laughs> he's no, he's asking Kofir, Kofir, you know, the, the pitch on no, the, that, is, that is painted on the pitch. It's a simple, similar word. Why is it a similar word? I don't know. You want to say maybe that the kapara covers over Cover. covers over the sin, makes it invisible. Yeah. He's trying to suggest an etymological connection between the two. It's an interesting problem mm -hmm. to think why the word is similar. Not ridiculous. Well. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Or you might say that it is a protection from the water that will seep through the wood of the boat and drown the people, that the kapara is an, is an atonement that will protect you from the punishment. That you I mean, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I'm just, you, yeah. you brought up the question. I never thought of it. Yeah. I never thought of it before. Mm -hmm. All right, something to think about, mm -hmm. to consider. But, 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 here, when he says kofir nafsha, it doesn't mean an atonement, right? No, you understand what it means? The word. Like it means, um, a pain, you saved my life. Mm -hmm. If you saved my life, I give you a reward for saving my life. I, I pay back for my, I give, I give restitution, you know, my life or my money. I'll give you my money. Yeah? Okay. Kofer nafsha. It's not kofer chatat, it's kofer nafsha, the way he's writing, the way he's reading it. Lifnei Hashem, shetitaher nimkor dameha, which whatever that means, that she will be purified in the source of her blood, which is the uterus, okay? Ki haisha belidita tihiela me'en nirpas 
umakor mishachet. Now that's, right? The woman, because the woman, he's trying to talk to you about the danger that she's at, right? Mm -hmm. The woman at the time of her birth is, um, it will have in her a mayan, a, a stream, a flowing of, what does nirpas mean? Do you know, anybody understand the word? What does he say here? Tall, fountain and a fountain a, of? Fountain and a tainted spring. A tainted spring, uh, no less, right? Umakor mishchat, okay? So therefore, it is at that time when she's giving birth, she is connected somehow to, to a stream that is flowing and, and somehow dangerous, tainted, right? And we know, by the way, that uh, if a woman does not separate, I don't know what kind of medicine he knew, but uh, a woman doesn't have the placenta separated and removed, by itself usually, right? The placenta peels away from the uterus after the baby is born. You're familiar with what I mean by the placenta? I can understand exactly what, why the people have to deal with, because i never seen that. Because I think that is it the, the, the doctor is taking out the placenta, or what is it? No, it, 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 it was delivered by itself. By itself. It, it is removed by itself. If it doesn't remove by itself, it has to be removed because it is dangerous. If it stays, then the woman will die. Women will get the septic shock. Because the, uh, there's a, a pad, it looks like a hand, mm -hmm. like a round dome that is connected to the inside of the uterus wall, mm -hmm. and it receives blood vessels from the mother through the system, through this pad. It's like a sponge. Mm -hmm. A lot, a lot, a lot of blood. It's, it's like, you don't even see blood vessels. It's like a mushy, like a sponge that you use in the, in the sink. Mm -hmm. yeah? Full blood. And it is connected to a, um, an artery, to an artery and a vein that goes to the baby. Mm -hmm. I'm the baby, right? And here's the placenta. So the, it travels, the blood goes to the baby and through the circulation of the baby and then comes back through a vein, mm -hmm. the umbilical vein, mm -hmm. to this placenta and has to pass out of it and into the bloodstream of the mother through the wall of the uterus and back to her heart and lungs and it gets oxygenated and through the kidneys and so on, it comes back again and to this placenta. So the placenta is a major, the baby can't live without the placenta. If, you, if the placenta separates from the uterus too early, then the baby doesn't have a chance. Because yeah. he loses blood, yeah. can't it doesn't get oxygen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have conditions called placenta previa, where placentas grow too close to the place where the baby is going to be delivered. So the baby actually pushes it, and that's not good, right? Or or if the placenta gets abruptly separated from the wall of the uterus before the baby is ready, then the baby will either die or has to be delivered oh, no. right away. All the time, right? the placenta is attached, attached the to place. the wall all the time. But not in the same place? Same place. Maybe same place? In oh, no, no. In, in every woman, it might be slightly a different place, okay. but it's in the wall of the uterus. All right. Right? It starts by... When the sperm goes into the uterus and travels out to the fallopian tubes, to these little tubes, hmm. towards the ovary, the two ovaries, an egg is matured by the mother, by this potential mother, the woman, and it travels down the fallopian tubes, and if intercourse happens at the right time, and the sperm survives and goes into this uterus and goes out to the tube and meets the egg, and they, and they become friends, then there will be the beginning of a developing baby, a few divisions of cells until it's about 16 or 32 cells, and it continues to travel this fallopian tube until it comes to the uterus, enters the uterus, this called the morula, this little developing future baby, right? It doesn't, it's not recognized as a baby yet, it's just a blob of cells, mm -hmm. and it f attaches itself to the inside of the wall. Mm -hmm. Where it is attached to the inside of the wall, it begins to develop this placenta, the future placenta, and the tube for itself, and its own developing baby. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, right? And in that place will be the placenta all the time from then on, right? Mm -hmm. So it depends where the little morula will plant itself on the wall. That's where the placenta will stay, has to stay there. When the baby is born, the baby is cut away from this tube and begins to breathe air 
It's yeah. amazing, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. usually people cut it. Uh, usually people cut it when the baby is born. Uh, you, you, will, you had your fallopian. That's your belly button. Hmm. Your belly belly button is the connection to the tube, and when it was cut, that tube kind of shrivels up and dies a little bit and kind of becomes a little indented. That's your mm -hmm. belly button. So the baby is always attached to this lifeline to the placenta. When the baby is born and he no longer needs that blood, right? So it is pinched off or it is cut. That's part of the midwife's uh, science. That's what they did always, mm -hmm. right? They, they detached the, the tube from him so the baby can now breathe and his own heart is working and he makes his own oxygen so he doesn't need the blood anymore from the mother. Right? Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Now, if the mother, if the mother is normal, what happens is the, the baby is born with physical muscular contractions of this uterus, right? It pushes and pushes and pushes the baby out. In doing that, it also detaches the placenta glued into the wall, right? And the placenta, after the baby is separated, usually kind of starts peeling away from the wall, and the vessels that connected it to the mother tighten up and mm -hmm. stop, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, yeah. the mother would bleed to death, yeah. right? Because yeah. she continues to produce blood right. into the placenta, then it's over, right? You, and then it doesn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So... Um, and there are conditions where a mother has given birth and the delivering mother, doctors have to know that the placenta has been delivered also. So they put their hand in there and they see, is it coming out, is it coming out, is it coming out? And usually she delivers it like the baby. She delivers it out the uterus just like the baby came. The baby came, the placenta comes. If that doesn't happen, it's a dangerous situation because there are all kinds of problems with this stagnant pool of blood in the in the uterus, in the placenta, right? It's this sponge is no longer being refreshed mm -hmm. with new blood going in and old blood going out, right? Like it was with the baby. So if it's old blood just sitting there, that's a source for infection mm -hmm. and problems. So he's talking about this makor mushchat, mm -hmm. trouble fountain, right? This this tainted fountain. fountain. He, it's not clear that they knew anything about this placenta and exactly what it means, but the, but the fountain of blood that was coming towards the baby all the time is now potentially dangerous. Okay. And now that she has stood and survived or persisted a certain time of cleansing, or maybe... I'm not sure what that means. I don't know what that means. Or the days of the creation of the baby. I'm not sure if, she, if he thinks that that's what creates the danger. I don't know. For a son or a daughter. She brings the ransom for her life. So that... Oh, you see that? She's actually in danger now, he says. And she's bringing um, a, a request to be given her life in exchange for this offering that she's making. She amod mikoravet tahir, so that so that the fountain will stop, will hold, and that she will become clean. Ki Hashem basar because God is the physician, the great physician of all flesh, and does wonders. Which he does. That's uh, that's from Asher, right? The Rabbeinu Amru and our rabbis have said, Oh, oh, oh! So let's stop. Stop. So so far, one explanation. Asher, right? I think. Oh, it's like Shmonesri. Shmonesri, we end our bracha. Wait, wait. Asha Yatzar. Right. Yeah, but is that not, that's not a quote? It is a quote, quote from, I think it's a quote from there. From the bracha. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so far, so far, what do we have is that this kofir is not a for sin, right? This explanation that he has so far. Correct. And I want to remind you that there's a Ramban. You don't have a Ramban on Breshi there, right? This is only on no. Exodus. On, on, uh, 
Is it Leviticus? Leviticus? Like that. That's too bad. Because, what do we have here? Nexus. Verse 1. Ramban on Breshi. Do you have a Ramban on Breshi? No. Somewhere? Must be. Must be. No? No. no. I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a little. You remember the story of Yaakov who was afraid that Aesop is coming and that will might kill him, right? Because of his soldiers coming after he was returning from Laban's house. Remember that? And he was coming towards Israel, returning towards Israel after the long time away. And he was afraid that Esau would come and destroy him, right? And he, and he sent out messengers to bring him gifts and so on, right? Right. You remember this, yes? Yeah. And, uh, and uh, the messengers came back and they said to him, we brought our gifts but he is now approaching here with soldiers, with 400 soldiers or whatever, right? Yes. Okay, so Yaakov becomes very frightened. What's going to happen to me, right? And he, um, and he divides the camp into different parts, right? And so on. And then finally, when, uh, when Esau arrives, Finally, when Esau arrives, we go to go and say the Shmot. I have a lot of Shmot. I don't have very sheep. Um, when he finally arrives, and he um, and he has all of his uh, flocks in front of him, meeting Esau and his children and his wives and so on. So uh, Esau says to him. Why did you, uh, you know, it's so good to see you. And he came and he kissed him, right? Mm -hmm. And he said to him, I, uh, I don't need your gifts. Uh, you know, why do you give me the gifts? So Yaakov said in his message to him, his, mes his uh, messengers had said, Akaprak panav. May I kapara, may I kapara his face whatever that means, right? Whatever that means, Kaparai's face. And, and uh, all, many of the Mepharshim seem to wonder about that. Does Yaakov mean to say that he is confessing that he had done a sin by stealing his Bechora and fooling their father to bless him instead of the firstborn, Esav? Is that what he means by Kaprapanav? So some people suggest, yeah, that's true. But that's very hard to say, right? Because the Torah seems to suggest that he deserved and that, uh, that, uh, that uh, his mother was correct and that he deserved the birthright and that Esau had forfeited the birthright and it was right. So you mean he's just fooling Esau? He doesn't really mean that he's confessing? He's just confessing for him to hear his confession? I mean... Is he now going to tell Esau, you're really the firstborn, I give up the first right, the birthright, if, I, if it's a sin, then it, I should do tshuva, right? But if I do tshuva, that means you're, you've got the bracha now, not me. Is that what he actually means to say? That's very hard to do too, right? Hmm? Uh, so that, that's a problem. So the Ramban there in the Torah at Achapra Panav, during that pasuk, takes this up. And he says, people misunderstand the word kapara. Mm -hmm. There. He says, kapara doesn't mean atonement for a sin. It doesn't mean. Yom Kippurim doesn't mean a day of atonement. There, he says. What does it mean? Kofer nefesh uses the same word. Kapara is, I am approaching a king, and I feel unworthy, and I feel like I almost have to buy my life's worth to be able to stand before you. I have to pay a ransom to even be allowed to stand here. And it was the way of Yaakov paying extraordinary tribute and honor to his older, to his brother, and saying, I'm sending these gifts as a tribute to you so that I can actually stand and see your face. And nothing to do with bad deeds. But nothing to do with, with uh, forgiveness for a sin. That what it means by, uh, and that's what it means Yom Kippur. 
we come to stand before Hashem, we will atone for our sins and we will uh, ask for slicha and mechila and we will do vidui and so on. But the Yom Kippur means that everything that we do on that day is in order to uh, to be permitted to stand in the inner sanctum of the king. Right? To stand before him. To lefana in his, to his face. To face him. Uh, panim. So if the, if the Ramban there said, and that's the first time that the word kapara in the Torah is used, by the way, with Yaakov, mm. right? Yeah. Yeah, but, but you point to that. Oh, because a, a couple, right. other than kofir for the teva, right. <laughs> right? Which is interesting. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I never thought of it before. But that's the first time the word kapara, right? Achapra mm. panav. So that would suggest a similar meaning here, right? She has been connected to a potential uh, dangerous fountain, whatever, tainted fountain, she now asks to be alive and well. Or had become tainted. In the or had become the tainted through the birth or something. I mean, I don't really, to, the details of what he knew, what he means by that, I don't know. But I could say that in our parlance, yeah. in our language, we could say this business of being in danger and being connected in some way to, to vulnerability. To, and now she is bringing this offering, chatat, even though the word chatat does suggest sin, right? The Ramban seems to ignore it, right? Completely, completely, the word chatat. The korban is called korban chatat. But now he says, la. by the way, in all of the sin offerings that we have in the Torah, when the Kohen administers it, it says, "Vikiper alav venislach lo." He will atone for him, and the man will be forgiven. Well, isn't here in the Torah? Let me just finish that. Here in the Torah, it doesn't say "Vikiper alav venislach lo." "Vikiper aleha v'tahira." Right? He does kapara for her, whatever the kapara means, and she is cleansed. She is purified. It doesn't say she is forgiven. Mm-hmm. Which is true for all the other chataot. If you look back in, in Parshas Vayikra, where everybody has a different chatat, you know, the king and the nasi and the kohen, gadol and the people and the individual, in all those cases it says, and he shall bring and be forgiven. And in that case, here, for some reason, it leaves that out. Why? Again and again and again. Right? Venislachlo. Al Kohen al Nin, Venislachlo. Right? Venislachlo. 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 Al Korban Hasham. And so that In every one of those cases. Okay. While here it says, Vichiper Aleha Vitahira. She is atoned, she is. She gets kapara and is cleansed, is purified. Which suggests that there's no sin. The only problem is that the Ramban doesn't bother of trying to explain why the, why the Torah calls it Korban Chatat. That's the only caveat. I mean, I don't understand how he gets away with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let me, let me I, I'm prepared to hear that uh, all cases of chatas uh, are accident, accidental sin. Yes. Right. So how does that work out here? Right. Um, so what does she do by what does she do by accident here? It's also it also happens to be yeah, because in a a for which she is following a, a command to produce mm-hmm. produce exactly. Yeah. It's also an avera for which one would be over kares, right? Uh, and this yeah. show game. Yeah, it, it, if one if if done be it, it's um, it would be kares. It would be kares, which has nothing to do with leda, right? So I mean, it's an enigma. To begin with, right? What, and of course, what, inadvertently, what, what, what does Vishogate mean? What, what, what sin does she, what this sin has she performed? What, uh, how does this work in, t- in terms of any of the chataot, right? I mean, that's the, right. that's the question. So the first understanding of the Ramban is that sin has not got to do anything with this, right? How he avoids the word chatat from the korban, I don't know, because he didn't discuss it, right? I don't think. Let's see. Does he? Is the first pasuk have something to do with it? No. No. But he certainly talks about kofer and kapara as a different process. 
from the general atonement of sin, right? Not atonement of sin. Right. It's kofer nefesh. He, she is paying a ransom for his life, for a reward, or a, a sort of like a tribute for saving her life. Why that's called a chatat, I don't know. But it's kapara, kofer nefesh. It's a hela. Now, the next, you remember the Ramban has usually a, a list of different explanations. Last time we had four or five of them mm -hmm. about uh, Aaron and his fear, what he was worried about. This time he has at least two, because we've done one. Let's look at the next one. Rabbeinu Amru, our rabbi, suggested a different explanation. And they work on the idea of Chadat, you'll see in a moment, right? When she was crouching, because uh, they used to sit, you know, women used to give birth on a stool, on a birth stool, yeah. almost like a toilet, like a like a, a douching uh, seat, right? They used to bend and stoop. Yeah. When the seat was very low, the seat was very low, they were bending down and they would, <gasps> like that, right? And all of a sudden strain, and the baby would be below, right? And the midwife, whoever was a delivering baby, would catch the baby from below. Mm -hmm. And they were upright, sitting. Mm -hmm. So, when she was crouching on her birth stool, kofetzet v'nishbaat, lo is a cake od l'bali. She bursts, kofetzet is jumps, but she sort of jumps to conclusion, I suppose you might say. You know, her pain and her travail is so extreme that she bursts out and says and swears, I'm never going to be with my husband again, right? I'm not going to do this ever again. Because of the pain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Terrible. Yeah. Right, and it's dangerous, and it's painful, and it's mm -hmm. and it's risky, and it's urgent. And, uh, mm -hmm. Right, terrible, terrible, terrible. I'm not. I'm never going to do this again. So she's she swears. Now, of course, this kind of a vow is not a valid vow. I don't think because of the circumstances. Yeah, uh, and and uh, <laughs> and anyway, so so because she has done that, and now she's finished, right, with the birth. And she now regrets, I mean, having made such a vow, and she wants to be with her husband again, and she wants to have a normal life, and she maybe even wants to have another baby one day, right? So she, uh, people easily forget these uh, terrible things. I don't understand it, because if people, I was a woman, uh, I probably would never go to the bar and get but, drunk. Uh, <laughs> but women, <laughs> next but women day, are amazing. What? People that get drunk. Next day, he says, never, never again. again. <laughs> right, never get drunk again. Right, okay. So, 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 according to them, the explanation of bringing a chatat would be she did it would be the pain. would be to lament, to regret, to regret having done this improper deed of swearing never to be with her husband again. That would be the chatat. That would be the kofir. That would be the kapara. According to them. There's a quote in the Gemara from Brachos, Amar of Papa Hilkach Nemrin Hu Leteravaihu. We will actually accept both explanations, the one about Kofer Nefesh and about, and about the vow. V'ikara kavana bazeh. And so the intention is, mainly, ki ba'avur shehi nishbaat mitoch hatsa'ar ve'ein ashwaru yalit kayem mifnei heyotam mishubarit l'ba'ala. That's what he's saying, okay. right? Because she is obligated which is interesting. Where's the obligation? I don't know. If, because she is obligated to be freely available to her husband, mm -hmm. and then she made a vow to contradict that obligation, and she did it out of pain and out of you know, stress, then this vow is not valid. It's not a real vow. It doesn't hold. Right? Right? Ratzta Torah kaper la me'alot rucha. The Torah wants to what does 47 mean? They want to again cleanse that's what she means that he, she has she has diminished her spirit, right? Her spirituality she, she did something that she feels bad about. How does, that, how does it mean that? Ma'ala, from the Mi'ila, you know what I mean? 
Yehuda, perhaps. Me'ilah means to take away from Kedusha, right? To take, uh, to, to demean Kedusha. So that when she said something like that, for example, even when though they, when it, they it are means arguing. to deny her normal life with her husband, she now feels that she somehow uh, blemished herself by saying such a thing. So the Torah wanted to give her an opportunity to to restore the the decline, the fall that she has made to her spirit. So that means that every day, every time that the woman get upset with her husband and say, I don't want to see you again or whatever, every time she has to go and... Uh, no, I, well, this is a little bit more extreme than that. That's what I try to... A little bit, a little here. bit, uh, a little bit, I don't know. Is Maybe, go ahead, <laughs> bring a korban, fine, I, it's fine with me. Yeah, because this... Yeah. <clears throat> it's fine with me, my, my wife uh, never said that to me yet. Yeah, I know so that. Far. I know. Uh, she wanted to, maybe, but she didn't say. Uh, uh, so, so, so the Torah wanted to give her an opportunity, you see that? Even though it's true that it is not valid, it's not binding, this, this vow is not binding. But she feels, how does a person feel when they have said something that they really feel terrible about? Yes. See, I wish you were dead, you say to somebody, yeah, right? Yeah. That you, that you, yeah. Then you say, oh my goodness, what did I do? What did I do? So, so the, the Torah wants to give you a process by which you will have an opportunity to restore, to erase, to, to get away from that bad thing that you did, bad feeling that you have. Right? So it gives you a korban, a tat, that you bring, and you come to the korban, and you bow before Hashem, and He does this korban for you, and, you, and He purifies you. So you come away feeling like, okay, God has straightened me out. I, I, before God, I straightened myself up. So, again, here it doesn't sound like it's a hate. It doesn't sound like this is a sin. It sounds like it is a besmirching of her spirit. It's a she she because of her desperate situation of giving birth and pain. She uh, I mean, let out something that uh, yeah, brings like, her down. It's something. It's like a sin. But it isn't. I mean, it's a... Um, but it isn't, right? Because the yeah. vow is not a vow. It's nothing, right? If she, if she, if she now thinks that she's usher to her vow, to her husband, then we would say that's what, not true. What's the, um, the, the, the reason for the vow? A vow exists, but um, there's a reason for it. Isn't there uh, such and such a... What do you mean by a reason? Um, why, did you, why did you make that uh, a, a, a vow? What, why, why did you do it? Were you, were you um, in an intense pain? I was in immense pain. I would, never, I would never think that I will really ever want to be really away from my husband for the rest of my life. Right. The vow is not a vow, right? Yeah. Mutana. Mufarla. That. He's saying it's not even that. You don't even ask, have to ask her any questions because she's already standing in her obligation to her husband and therefore the vow would not be valid no matter what. Even if she wants to continue saying that it's a vow, it's not a vow. This right? I mean, that's what I, it does I, say. I've never seen that before. But yeah, but, but, but for a moment, <laughs> what you could see in his position is that this is not even a vow. So she, she not, didn't commit any sin, and there's no problem here at all. We understand she's an idiot when she's in that kind he's of situation. Not, she not, says, he's not, she says, he's not an idiot. No, she said something <laughs> that she couldn't help herself. She couldn't help herself. She lost her temper, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean anything. So if it doesn't mean anything, why does she need a chatat? So he is saying the Torah is looking after her. She's walking around feeling bad. Feeling bad about what she allowed herself to do. Shouldn't I have been more brave? Shouldn't I have been more holy in my time of giving birth? What was I saying? What was I thinking? You know, well, she's depressed, right? So here's a korban chatat. Sometimes a sinner... I, or a person who feels bad about himself may need to, to atone for something, even if the Torah says, no, no, there's nothing wrong with you, you're a good person, don't, don't bother, don't feel guilty, forget it, right? But he doesn't forget it. He doesn't forget it. So what are you going to do for him? Say, I'm sorry, you can't bring a chatat because you have no sin, so go home. And he says, oh, but please, 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 right? So he, he's given an exercise 
according to the Ramban, he's giving an exercise to work out his bad feelings about what he did, even though we don't hold him responsible, you're okay, right? But it gives him a chance to feel that he is cleansed, because he wants it, because he needs it. Very interesting approach, according to the Ramban, right? Because, you know, the, from the Hamamar Chazal, because she swore, da da da, that's where they ended. That's why she has to bring the Chatat, period. Yeah. The Ramban's explanation of that is very interesting, right? Because he does not want to accept that there's a sin here. They might, yeah. the Chazal, yeah, that's they right. might, taken literally the way we usually take it, right? Yeah. She made a vow, and therefore it's a wrong thing to do, and therefore she has a hate, and therefore she needs this atonement of some kind. Since when does a vow to be canceled need a korban chatat? I don't know. Right? Usually there's a process. You ask a person, did you mean it? Da, 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 but, but, and then the vow is canceled. But, you don't have to bring the chatat. But until, until, um, until you establish, I mean, doesn't, uh, who, who, um, who absolves the person? Okay, so until that, there, there is a vow. So there's a vow. But there's no hate until you violate the vow. There's no hate to make the vow. Right? If she if she if if somebody thought that this was a real vow that is binding, then the only time that there would be a sin is if she would have intercourse with her husband again. Despite the vow. Right? That would be the hate. But then you'd have to do something about uh, some kind of an atonement for the transgression. But according to the Chachamim, just having made the vow is where they ended. And if that's the case, then all she has to do is go to Amit Chacham, Amit Chacham and discuss it, and uh, the vow would be abstant, uh, you know, absolved anyway. So the Ramban's trying to do something pretty creative there, right? But that's the Kafara. Uh, right? Umachshavot Hashem Yitbarach Amukot. And the thoughts of God are very deep. Verachamav Merubim. You see what he's talking about here? And his mercies are great. Shehu Rotzer Lehatzdik Priyotav. He wants to justify. He wants to make them righteous. He wants to make them righteous in their own eyes. Some, somewhat, right? Mm-hmm. She's got a problem, right? In She's got a problem. In, in his... Well, his, I don't think he's got a problem with her. You know, if he actually... Um, I don't think God has a problem with her. He understands her very well. And, and in fact, Hashem caused her this... Yeah, I mean... Pain. But he's the one who brought, who brought the pain upon womankind at the time of Adam and Chava. That's a good point. So how could yeah. he possibly blame her? He wouldn't blame. That's yeah. a very good point. Yeah, because he, well, he has a lot of compassion for her. Well, he he says, listen, <laughs> I'm the one who caused you my child. I'm sorry, but uh, yeah. you really have this pain because I gave you this pain. Mm-hmm, All right. no, no. I mean, however you put it, God created woman that way, right? I mean, in our world. So, so, and that's what compelled her to, to behave that way or to speak that way. Then Hashem is certainly the last one who's going to hold her responsible. So she, you see, Rachamav Akom Asav Rotzela Hatzdik Priyotav means he wants to, I mean, she feels down. That's what It's postpartum depression almost, right? So she feels down. So you bring the Chatat, you bring this Kofer Nefesh to purify herself to herself. The Ramban doesn't seem to say that there's any sin going on here, right? Not in the case of the danger that she comes through and the ransom of her life that she's bringing because she's so grateful to be alive and well. And this one here is feeling down because she reacted so negatively at the time of the giving birth and she feels bad about it. So we, we could say to her, don't worry, my child, go ahead, go ahead, it's okay. Right? But she doesn't feel good. So you give this drama, you play out this, this, this procedure, right? this ritual of making her feel like she's coming out of this. Bad. So this is contrary to the idea the Christian that believe that this kapara means to go back to to original, to sin. original sin. Oh yeah, completely. But th- th- nobody mentions that here, because right. we don't have original sin actually. Exactly. It's very loving when you think about it. It's a very beautiful thing, no? I mean, I think that's what it means. 
But I think that's what the Ramban means. I'm looking for the Amish where we inflicted on uh, Chava. Batsar Tel Bivani. That's a Tel Bivani. No, Tel Bivani. Even that, even even your pregnancy will be difficult, right? And the etz of Teldibanim. And this is interesting. In our parlance now, and despite all that, you're going to desire your husband. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not not bef- It's not mentioned before. It's mentioned after the birth. Yeah, yeah. This is connected. It, it yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Following also, following. despite the fact that you may make a vow when you have this terrible pain and, and childbirth, you will still have a desire for your husband. Right. Oh my goodness, yes, yes, that's a very interesting point, right? Yes. You're going to be stuck, this, this psychology, right? You might say, after giving birth once, a woman would never want her husband again, and says, to hell with the husband, who needs him, right? I don't want this anymore. And yet, you see women keep going back again, I mean, for the, for the husband it's easy enough, I mean, all he has to do is feed another mouth, but uh, he doesn't have the pain. Pregnancy or the birth. Yeah. Okay. So, so I, I think that's uh, fascinating, the Ramban's idea about this. Hmm. I wonder if the rabbi will talk about this in his. his he never does. So he won't discuss this one. And next one is, if you want to go into the into the. Uh, this was short. I don't know. What is it? Eight twenty-eight. Yeah, well, 10, 15 minutes we might. What do you think? Yeah, we could try. Mem Zayin is a Pasuk uh, uh, 47 in chapter 13. Pasuk 47, in which talks about the different uh, lesions that occur in, in uh, the skin and then in a clothing and then in a house. Right? Of Tzorah, Mitzorah. Whatever it means. We don't have such a thing today, probably, at all. Vahabeged, Mem Zayin is Vahabeged. And the clothing, after talking about the person and his body, right? Hair and skin and so on. Then you talk, all of a sudden, there's a lesion that happens on a beged, on a clothing, a cloak. Ki hiye bo nega tzarat. Vahabeged, semer, or vahabeged, pishtim, or vishti, or vahabeged, or vishtim, or semer, all kinds of different materials, right? So... Right away, the Ramban wonders, what's going on here? Who ever heard of a disease in a clothing? I know diseases in people, he says, right? But diseases in clothing, what kind of... So I can see some a tailing... The clothing gets torn, a clothing gets stains, you dr- drop the wine on your clothing, so it gets a stain. But what's but this you disease? You put uh, Clorox. Clorox. Yeah, so it loses its color or whatever, but I never heard of a disease. Mm. Okay, so on that... He says, this is not normal. It's not a condition that caused by some medical thing. It is on our page, Ayin Hay. In the, in the uh, Ramban. Vahabeged. Um, okay, it's fairly short. Zeinenu beteva klal. This is not natural. Right? Velo hava ba'olam. And never has occurred in the world. Doesn't, doesn't, it's not a normal occurrence. Also in houses, where does a, where does a lesion, a disease happen to a house? Right Later on, the Torah is going to discuss how it, it stones a house, get spread. a disease, and so on. Right. He will discuss that. Right. So it also, it's not natural, he says. Aval biyot Yisrael shleimim lashem. Because the Jewish people are completely Connected to God? What does he have there? Devoted. Devoted to God. Yihye ruach Hashem alehem tamid. The Spirit of God will be upon them always. Lehaamid gufam upigdehem uvatehem bemaretov. To sustain their bodies and their clothing and their houses in a good condition. Of like, course, that's like fantastic. Like he did in, 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 the, in, in the desert. Remember? Like what? He did what Hashem did in, 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 in the desert. You remember that they never your shoes, uh, lose your shoes because... Uh, they didn't rub out and... Uh, 
and so on and so on. Yeah, well, it is a very difficult thing to say in our normal world because we have children being born without an arm and we have handicapped children being born and we have Tay-Sachs disease killing babies and we have uh, people of all kinds of conditions in the, among the people who are devoted to God. Who, so, so he wants to sustain their bodies beautifully and their homes and their clothing. I mean, maybe it's the time of the Midbar, especially, you know, the time of the desert, of their first formation of the people. Maybe that seemed to be more consistent to him. To him. This is the Ramban talking. Don't, don't ask me questions. But, yeah... So God wants to sustain their body and clothing and houses in a good appearance. Kasher When one of them, people, will have a, to occur in his life, a some kind of a sin, There will immediately, the consequence of the sin will be that there will be an appearance of something wrong with his body or his clothing or his house to show him that God has removed himself from him. So this, he says this is a miracle, right? You, you, the reason we don't have that today is because we don't have that today. God doesn't give us automatic signs about our, our spiritual conditions and relationship to him. But he's saying in those days, that's what God was giving them. Now, you know the Ramban's attitude about miracles, right? That all the obvious miracles that occurred in Mitzrayim and during the 40 years in the desert, and shortly maybe a few in Eretz Israel, were all meant to train them to understand that there was God in the world who was taking care of them, right? And that he runs history and that he's going to reward and punish and so on. In order to get that training properly, God had to be much more in your face. Obvious. Make himself obvious. So they would be trained to understand. On days, but yeah. on me. You wake up in the morning, God gives you food. Yeah. Puts the food on the table, right? So with the man, right? You want meat, he'll give you meat. You get thirsty, he gives you water in an obvious, miraculous way from, the, from, from, a, from, a, from a rock, right? He, he, if there are any enemies, they get wiped out. Everything is, you're carried, I, you know, I carried you on eagle's wings, he says, you know, I want you to, I want you to, you know that that's what I do, right? And all those miracles in Mitzrayim and the Kriyat Yam Suf, of course, and so on, right? He says, Ramban says, how come we don't see that anymore? He says, because that was necessary for people who were in development, right? And we today are supposed to be so far beyond that training that we see God in a flower, you know, we see God by waking up in the morning and we take a breath, right? Or we see God because we have a mind that thinks, you know, right? See God in the face of the person that we love. So we, we, we understand miracles in, that are hidden miracles, and they needed miracles that were open miracles. So this, Tarad, is an open miracle, right? Everybody's beautiful, everybody's great. As soon as somebody does something wrong, Hashem gives him a message. Right away. But the message is only for the people, not for, for the people that commit the sin, not for the entire congregation. Well, that's a problem. Why? You see that people do see it. I don't, you're asking a question or are you saying? I'm asking. Um, but, you, but you notice that Sarat is a form yes. in which other people will see. And in fact, they're, ex they're exiting from the camp. They sit outside until yeah, they get better. It's so it's like a pretty a, disgraceful. And like a, a collateral damage to the entire congregation. Um, I, I don't know. But that's a good point. I mean, if, if God was only interested in giving the message directly to the person, then he would do it in a way that would not have to be socially obvious. He, I thought you were asking the question. I thought you were challenging me because it sounds like if God wants to make a miraculous message to me that I have transgressed. Why doesn't he do it in a private fashion? How does, how does this affect the rest of the uh, congregation? If a person is a sinner, then he might affect other people too. If he, yeah, if he yeah, deviates but, from but, God's covenant, but, if he does something right, right, so therefore... Make contagion? No, no, no. Contagion, you mean in terms of attitude? 
in terms of, of affecting other people in terms of the chayv, not not in terms of the of the sarat. No, 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 no. I'm trying to answer his question. Why is it that I thought it was a question? Guy, he's saying you pr- person's spiritual life is is made obvious. Yeah. Right. Very, very center. Right. If he is spiritually correct, then he's beautiful. Everything's great. And when he falls, falters from his spiritual responsibilities, he gets sarat mm-hmm. in his body or his clothing or his house, right? As a message that God has departed from him. So his question was, well, God should choose a way that would uh, not... Uh, I thought that was the question. Yeah. That would not make him publicly known that this was so. And yet, Sarat is one in which the public is aware. Why? Why should it be in such a way that it's anonymous? That it's anonymous. Why should it be? Because <laughs> because man's sin. Initially, it's himself. anonymous. Man, but man's sin between him and God is his own business and God's business. Why would uh, Why would God yeah, want? Sooner or later, why would God want? Know about it. Why? Yeah, it's a rat. Yes. Yo, so I'm saying, why you? Are you are you happy with it that people will know, or are you wondering why that should be? What is the, what is the no, point I of what you're saying? I don't want, I'm trying to understand the, the complete uh, strategy, you know. So which what are you, is this making it better or making it worse that other people will know? Worse. Worse because uh, the shalom and and, and ben Israel is is broken. Listen, Pinky. Today, yeah. today. I eat something that isn't kosher. Do you need to know this? Do you need to know that I did that? Or do I have my own atonement between me and God that I have to confess, I have to think, I have to do tshuva, I have to decide that I did terrible things and I have to decide never to do it again? What? Is it your business? Oh, no. Is it Aliyah's business? No. Is it Rabbi Gatli's business? It isn't. So. It is the Kohen's business. So I, I thought that was the question that you were asking. Tzarat, he says, a person is chote. Hashem immediately show, gives him a sign, him a sign, that he has departed from him. Mm-hmm. So that would be satisfactory, fine. I think that's very nice because God wants to teach me right away. Today, God, I do something like that. God doesn't say anything, right? He waits for me to realize and to have my own conscience to correct myself, Right? There's no sign from heaven when I do that. I mean, people say, oh, I'm going to do something, it's going to be, I'm going to be hit by lightning. You know, that's primitive. That's primitive thinking in religious thought to us. He's saying that they were primitive. So Hashem behaved with them like a primitive person. Mm-hmm. You do something wrong, patch. Yes. Right? A parent has to be standing over you all the time, right? Because if the parent is not there, then the child doesn't know the difference between right and wrong. He, by himself, he would not, yeah, sure, I'll take a cookie. Right? Even though I'm not supposed to, but if the father is there, he wouldn't dare because he would get a bash. Right. right? So, I mean, this sounds like immediate, immediate uh, positive and negative reinforcement. Right? Immediate. So, fine. But today that doesn't happen, right? So there's no tzarat today. I mean, that's... If you understand, it's just like the open miracles that the Ramban said are necessary for all kinds of things that God did. So there's another one of them. In, a, in an age when people were like that, right? So he says, uh, the only problem, I thought you were introducing a problem that it becomes a public event. And I don't know why, according to the Ramban's thinking, that this is reinforcement for sin or righteousness, why it has to be a public event. For the same reason you, you said. So we now wonder that maybe if a person transgresses and God doesn't correct him right away and in public, that he might, uh, he might affect others. Other people might follow him as well. Mm-hmm. That also suggests a kind of a primitive society in which... Uh, all right. No, no. Tsar me alav. V'lachain, l'chach, amar ha-katu v'natati nega tsarad v'bayit eretz v'ur achuzatchem. That's why the Torah says, and I will give a, a plague of, of some kind of tsarad in the house of your land. land. That you have inherited. Kihi makat Hashem It is the, the 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 infliction affliction in the house of God, right by God. 
והנה איננו נוהג אלא בארץ, it does not happen except in ארץ ישראל, שהיא נחלת השם, because it is the inheritance of God, כמו שאמר כי תבואו אל הארץ כנען אשר אני נותן לכם לאחוזה, I'm giving you this land, right? And therefore it happens in this land, my land. ואין הדבר מפני היותו חובת קרקע, it's not because there, well, to, to, as a small introduction, there are some mitzvot that are only customary in Eretz Israel, like Maaser and Truma and Shmita and so on, right? Because those are the things that the land requires you to do. But here he's saying this tarat is not one of those things like a mitzvah that is connected to the land, but it's a something else. Why is it only in Eretz Yisrael? It's only in the land in which Hashem is dwelling. So since Hashem is here in this land in Eretz Yisrael, therefore it makes sense that when you do a sin, He can't stand being with you. You know what I mean? Because this is His land. Right? So you... There's a reaction to your transgression. Well, if you're in Muncie, there's no reaction because you didn't besmirch the land in Muncie. The land in Muncie anyway is not pure, right? Hashem is really not hovering here as much as in Eretz Israel anyway. He's somehow floating anyway above, so he doesn't react to sin right away, he says, right? It doesn't even happen until after the land of Israel is been, has been conquered. Because mm-hmm. before that, it isn't yet the land of the Jewish people and God dwelling in it. Once it, the people have already distributed the land among them. Right? That's when this occurs. Then all of them are settled in their minds, Ladat et Hashem, to know God, and the Shekhinah will dwell among them. Mm-hmm. And I think it happened also that way with clothing, not only with the houses. It doesn't happen anywhere else. Only in white clothing. Uh, not in color. He's right, because people may even understand, misunderstand. If you have dyed clothing, in those days they didn't have fast dyes like we do. You know, you, your dye becomes, you're gray and it's going to stay gray. Right? But in those days they used vegetable dyes on their clothing. So if you made a, 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 a colorful dye, mm-hmm. it could easily be by the nature of the dye that it could be washed out, it could get Fade. streaky, it could be faded, right? So you would not know from a change in color, Pinky, in the colored clothing that it was Sarat, right? You wouldn't get a message, this is God speaking to you, right? Because, eh, you know, they would say, yeah, you know, it's just a, you had a lousy vegetable dye. You didn't do a good job, right? Talk to your wife. It has nothing to do with God, right? But if it's white clothing and something happens in white clothing, that's not normal, right? And that would be the miraculous message from God, he says, right? Um, and therefore, oh, therefore, colors which are colored by nature, by art, what, what is Bidei Shamayim colored? Do you know? 58. In the Gaim, there's something interesting. I don't know what it is. I don't know what he means. You have to look up that Gemara, Yud Alef Gimel. Uh, well, I don't know. I don't know what he means. But apparently, it's only colors that are made by man that are, don't get sarat. But if there's color that God make, then there is sarat. Don't know the answer. Val derech hapshat mipnei ze yachziru yachziru akatov b'chol pasuk a pasuk habeged o or o ashiti veha erev ki adavar neis. This is all miraculous. Leravotenu. And he says there are many, many other midrashim about, about what Sarat is, you know, Lashon Hara and all kinds of other things. You remember the Batim, people say that Sarat happens in the Batim because you have to break the bait and it was meant to punish a person. If I come to you and I say, could you lend me your blender, you know, the Cuisinart? So you say, no, I don't have one because you don't really want to give it to me to be used because I might break it. You really have one, but you say, no, I don't have one. Right? So then, one of the Midrashim says, then you will get Sarat in your house, and then they will have to take apart your house, 
And when you take apart your house, you're going to have to carry out all of the uh, furniture that you have, and then the, the blender will be there. People will say, oh, you, I thought you didn't have a blender, really, Alan. <laughs> right? That would be a very great disgrace for you, right? So I, there are all kinds of midrashim pieces to explain what Sarat is supposed to accomplish. But, uh, but generally speaking, because you have to do what? Your article awaits you. So, the shame shall mind. Right. Of course. Okay. Uh, a pleasure. We, it was almost perfectly to the hour. We started uh, sometime around. It was 7.40 when we finished Marv. Hmm. And it's All right. Whatever, whatever, yeah, whatever, whatever, yeah. whatever the weather, we're weather the weather, whether we like it or not. Are you going to be here for Shabbat? Um, In town? I think so. I think so. Then I shall see you. Right. Have a good night. Good night. Yeah. Okay, so now, of course, I was trying to connect this miracle of Sarat to the obvious miracles that Hashem was doing for the Jewish people as part of their training. And you see, the Ramban is a little different, really, because he says it didn't happen in the desert for clothing and for build for houses. It did happen on people. It did happen on people. Remember Miriam, who came with some yes. of It did happen on people. So I could still say that it is when, when God hovers among the people so close, he shows them by making them all beautiful and pure. And when they do something wrong, he there's an obvious, like a magnet, you know what I mean? It's sort of an obvious repulsion. And the obvious repulsion there's a message to the person. You have just repelled God. You have a little spot on you that shows that you are no longer perfect. Okay. Uh, and now we understand why we don't have... If, if the Ramban's idea of miracles in general is the way I said that it is a time of necessary training for people to understand God, even though, he, even though they should understand God is present and what he feels, even if he's not making it so obvious, right? They should believe it, but they don't, so they need things like Sarat to explain no, it. Another way, um, I think always happen that people that is trying to get closer with Hashem, with the Torah, Never follow the Torah, okay? And trying to get excited to get close to Judaism, whatever. So Hashem used to show him some kind of miracles yeah. that didn't happen with us, for example, because we are keeping the Torah for a certain period of time. You're but with this yeah. new, uh, newcomer, it's different. Yeah. It's the same like uh, Hashem made with us in, in the in Bamidbar. Yeah. No? It, I'm it happens. You, you, you no, I'm saying, I'm saying because, you, you because that that is I know a lot of people that is telling me, more uh, happened this to me, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, Hashem is with me, oh, for Hashem. They have an experience. An experience. That they feel, beautiful. That they feel is miraculous. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But in a, uh, in the in, in the process, it's getting more close and close, and he's knowing more and more and more. These miracles is so. Then they might be disappointed later. Yeah. How come God is no longer making it so obvious? Because he was so training him. Because to. you are now. So that's a good way to explain it to yourself. Because yes. people sometimes can be very very excited in the beginning because they have this sign from God. Yes. And then they learn more and more and more, and they say, what happened to, where is he? How come he's not talking to me again? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's very that's the question. I, could I make myself, hey, what happened? <laughs> I'm told. No? Okay, so then the commitment has to be from within, from a person's own spirit. It'd be just, like, just like this, right? Yeah, like in a, the beginning, in the beginning, you have to I'm, start. Bring, I'm training you, I'm bringing you up, I'm raising you, I'm educating you, so I am right here. And later you are a mature person, you should understand me. Because I'm of behind that, the scenes. 
And because of that, I, I understand what is the difference between emuna and bitachon. Because emuna is the beginning, you fail. And bitachon is the conclusion of your faith. It's the, the power of your faith. You have to, to show Hashem that you are really believing Him. You know? No, because the not miracles. Because of a miracle. Yeah. It's not easy. Yeah.